Good morning. I'm William Porter McRoberts, MD. I am here in Fort Lauderdale, South Florida. And today I'm going to talk to you about facet joint arthritis and facet disease and chronic low back pain, axial low back pain, different than say spinal stenosis and neurogenic claudication. And today what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a visit just like you were one of my patients and describe what's going on and how this works and what to expect from the treatments and uh, what it is and all the questions that you might have as a patient. So first, uh, how does spinal arthritis present? Uh, arthritis is defined as uh, degradation or uh, wear and tear on a joint, specifically what we call a diarthrodial joint, not necessarily a disc. And so this arthritis, as you know, can occur in pretty much any joint in the body uh, it affects about 40% of Americans over the age of 45 in one joint someplace or another, be it a large joint or the spine. It's very common for this. Uh, we see all the ads for Motrin and all the different uh, Tylenols and special sauces, etc. cetera. Um, it's a big league issue and it causes great disability. And it's something that is also entirely treatable with minimally invasive techniques, ultra minimally invasive techniques, uh, with great outcomes very safely. Uh, when I started uh, fellowship and training uh, a couple of years ago, I was told that we can only cure a few things in the spine. And for that matter, we can very rarely find out the cause of pain. Um, that's changed immeasurably in uh, the time that I've been practicing, almost 20 years. And so now we have, uh, we can develop a diagnosis for your low back pain about 85, 90% of the time. And what I mean by that is instead of just saying it's uh, bad muscles or um, a sprain or a strain, we can with great precision uh, as a, a function of MRI, CT scans, and then the diagnostic tests we perform on the spine, we can come up with a conclusion and a diagnosis which, in the majority of cases, will result in a treatment outcome, which is quite beneficial. So, let's just dive right in. What is a facet joint? A facet joint is the, it's the, the articulation of the back of the spine. You can see, of course, in this little model, we have um, a few things. In each segment of the spine, you can see the, the bone, the disc, the bone, the disc, the bone, in the back part of the spine, you can see there are these articulations. Right here you can see one, and right here you can see one. That articulation is a facet joint. And interestingly, as we bear weight on the spine, there's compression of the disc, as you can see, and then there's also movement uh, and compression of the facet joint. As we stand and walk, interesting, just like spinal stenosis, we have lumbar extension. That means more motion within the joint and the joint gets loaded as we stand and walk and as we sit generally what happens is the femurs uh, come forward and it decompresses the spine decompresses the posterior spinous elements and so the facet joints are offloaded when we sit and that's generally i say generally because it's a common occurrence not not every case is like this people have relief when they sit and have pain when they stand and when they walk in the low back I want to make the difference. Spinal stenosis is significantly different in that, also associated with standing and walking, the pain is, it generally goes into the buttocks and then down the legs, hips, thighs, maybe even calves get tired. Similar in that it's associated with the standing and walking, but very different in terms of the radiation. Spinal arthritis or facet joint arthritis is low back pain, which can radiate to the outer hip, but it hardly ever goes down into the knee or down into the back of the thigh or down into the calf. That's saved for, uh, for spinal stenosis. So we know by looking at MRIs that approximately 40% of 40 year olds already have degradation within their spine who also have no complaints. Interesting prospective study looking at uh, MRIs of the spine for essentially no reason. Uh, there are people who had abdominal pain, et cetera, and included the spine but we already saw facetogenic changes earlier before the pain starts in approximately 40% of people. The bottom line is if you're on a planet with gravity, you're going to have wear and tear on the spine. There's no one out there who finishes their 70, 80 year old journey without loss of height. And this height loss uh, comes from loss of height in the disc, but it also comes with uh, commensurate compression 
of the facet joints. So let's look at it on, uh, on the CT scan and MRI and kind of get a picture of what this looks like. All right, so this is a CT scan, CAT scan, which is really just a bunch of x-rays uh, laced together in three-dimensional format of a patient of mine. And you can see, just like we were talking about, here's the, uh, the spine. This person is uh, lying on their back. This is up. This is ventral, more towards the stomach. This is the skin of the low back here, subcutaneous tissues. And then if we get the picture just right, you can see the spinous processes here, 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 and here. You can see the canal coming down here. We did a myelogram, so we put a little contrast in the intrathecal space. Interestingly, you can see he really doesn't have spinal stenosis. That space is open, but he does have degenerative disc disease, and he does have facet, uh, uh, specific facet arthritis, which is significant. So here are the discs. It's interesting. You can see what's called a vacuum disc phenomenon here at L5-S1, another one at L4-5. These are indicative of significant uh, motion and they are the artifact of, of movement and, and wear and tear on the disc. You can see the spurring and lipping of the anterior portion here, same here, same here. Luckily, this gentleman uh, had more of the disc uh, degradation anteriorly and not posteriorly, so he doesn't have spinal stenosis. So he really just has low back pain. It's associated with standing and walking. So we're in the midline and uh, that's right down the center of the spine. That is not where the facet joints lie. They lie off of the midline, left and right. So I'm going to change that so we can see. We can go over now. We're going over towards his left side. Okay. And we're going over and you can see here are the facet joints right here, right here, here, and here. And he actually has a small, um, there's another part of the facet joint right there, right there, right there. And I'm going to try and find a more normal looking facet joint. Here's a more normal facet joint up here. There's no abernation, it's clean. Uh, those lines are nice and straight. This is up in his thoracic spine where he has no pain. But if you come down here, you see, and that's on his left side, right here. You can see some abernation right there, irregularity within the joint, abernation irregularity within the joint, and significant abernation irregularity within the joint. Here's his calcific aorta, kind of interestingly there. Let's go on over to his right side. Again, the vacuum disc phenomena, this black line, vacuum disc, some vacuum disc there. We actually see vacuum joint in his L5. So that's actual air within the joint. You see a little fracture here in what's called the pars, and you see the irregularity of the joint, which is almost, you can't even see the joint at the four or five. And so this gentleman has uh, significant low back pain when he walks, and it's largely uh, exonerated and, and, and he's pain-free when he sits, which, for uh, a little um, additional little clue, sitting puts more weight on the anterior column on the disc. And so even though he has degraded discs, they are not painful. And we know that based on his history. Okay, so I've actually now pulled up the MRI of my patient's wife, um, and she has similar problems. I'm gonna show you an MRI now, which is a bit different than the CAT scan. It's, um, it shows soft tissue. It doesn't so show joint quite as well but it does show joint. And uh, I'm also gonna show you something we find uh, that's very common in people who have facet uh, issues, and that's atrophy of the paraspinal muscles. And uh, those are the muscles, essentially the back strap of a cow or any uh, mammal uh, that provide the support for extension. So here we go. Okay, so now we're looking at the MRI. And MRIs uh, really focus on soft tissue. This is again the midline uh, section, hemisection. And here over here is the axial cut. So these lines correlate with each other. This purple line here correlates with this slice. The first thing we're looking at here is the cross section of the filet mignon, essentially, which is the lumbar paraspinal muscles. And you can see the dark is the actual muscle fiber and the light is the marbling or fatty content of the muscle. It is arguably um, close to 50% fat and it should be more like 90% muscle, 10% fat. So this segment, this cut is right at the L5S1. I'm gonna come up a little bit and we're gonna to start to see the facet joints. So you can see here's a facet joint right here, here's a facet joint right here, and you can also understand that if these were to get more arthritic and thicker, they would start to push in on the thecal sac causing spinal stenosis. Again, that is not her symptom. 
her symptom is that she has axial low back pain with walking. And you can see on this joint, see how it kind of comes in here? This is her left side. And on the right, it starts here and then it walks all the way around and it actually lips around. This is the body building bone, trying to stabilize the joint so it doesn't move. It doesn't have stability found in the muscles right here. So it literally is trying to wall off and, and fuse the joint um, so that there's more stability within the spine. We'll continue on up here. You can see another one, it's not the greatest MRI, but nevertheless, you can see this kind of walling, lipping again of this facet joint. This one has a crack in it. Um, but again, lots of arthritis around the actual joint. If we go on up here, now here's that uh, L3-4. Again, somewhat better. Let's see it go up to 2-3. Little fluid in the joint here, but better. Not nearly as, uh, as large. You can see the top facet joints are virtually perfect right here at uh, T12-L1. So what are we gonna do about it? Um, luckily, we have a lot of things we can do. So Americans being Americans, people being people, we all got this way because we're lazy. Let's face the facts. We didn't do our exercises as we should. We probably stayed out too late, got up too late, and didn't take care of our back like we should be doing. But we're in this pickle. And the pickle is that there is hypermobility within the spine. And every time that arthritic painful joint moves, it hurts, just like ground glass grinding. And so, um, and especially putting weight on the spine. There are a variety of options. The first is physical therapy. Um, I'm a large proponent of physical therapy when there's an indication. And in this particular circumstance, there is. If we can firm up those lumbar paraspinal muscles and reduce the motion in the spine, the pain will get better and or go away. And this is shown. We, we actually know that extension exercises are one of the very few exercises that actually have data and clinical correlation to outcomes. And it's one of the other reasons we try and implant neuromodulation devices to stimulate the muscle to build them up. Um, this is, uh, the entire concept behind a certain type of uh, peripheral nerve stimulator, which is implanted simply to build muscle so that the patient essentially does the physical therapy, whether they're at the gym or not, driving in traffic, eating dinner, it's stimulating the muscle. However, if you have um, a little more self-control than most and you're able to uh, simply do some exercises, it bears that people who do them, who do extension exercises, which is essentially the Superman, I'll show it to you later, they actually get clinical benefit and probably around 30 to 40% of them get enough benefit that they don't need to go on and do anything at all. So you find yourself in this decision-making process. Are you the kind of person who's gonna do it, do the physical therapy on a daily basis, like brushing your teeth? If you're a good tooth brusher, you'll probably also be a good back extensor um, and you'll do your back hygiene as well. But if you're not, and you're, you're more like a normal person and um, you don't do it, or if the disease is so advanced that you have pain and you're disabled by the pain, then we have to consider all the remaining options of which there are many. Okay, first, how do we make this diagnosis? The diagnosis is surprisingly easy to make and robustly done. The first thing we do is we take you to the procedure room or the OR and we do something called a facet joint nerve block, an FJMB, also known as a medial branch block, an MBB. It is the medial branch of the dorsal primary ramus, the little nerve that's coming out, and it goes to the facet joint. So we take you to the OR, prep your back, lay you down, and I'm going to take you in. You can see one of these, uh, hopefully a little bit, in a little bit. You can see what it's like. It's essentially like numbing up a tooth. And I always make the adage, if you go to the dentist and you have jaw pain and you don't understand where the pain's coming from, the dentist has looked in there, he can't see anything wrong. If he numbs up the correct tooth, the pain will go away doing two things. One, making you feel better temporarily, but it will also identify and implicate that tooth as being the problem and concomitantly it will exonerate or prove that all the other tooths are not the problem. If you walk out pain-free after you numbed up the correct tooth, we know that whatever you numbed up, say second molar, is the problem tooth. 
The same philosophy and adage applies to lumbar facet joint nerve blocks, which are we essentially bring you in, we no incisions, uh, numb you up just like the dentist, little needle, we go down to the actual nerve. And if you can see here, I've drawn in the nerve. This is the main nerve coming out, okay? We don't go here. Instead, we go right here next to it along the actual, uh, what we call the SAP, superior articular process. And I've drawn in the nerve there, and you can see it, that's going up to the joint, that's that black line, and then down to this joint. And we simply put the needle right here, and we put a little small aliquot of, say, lidocaine or marcaine, uh, some appropriate numbing medicine, and we numb up the joint by numbing up the nerve. Then we numb up the subsequent joints. We usually do a, few, a couple, because it's very unusual to have just one joint that's arthritic without, since this is a kinetic chain, all aging at the same rate. So we numb up the bottom few joints and we see how you do. That numbing medicine, as you know, takes a little bit to start working. It'll take, honestly, around 10 minutes. Uh, most of the time we use a longer acting numbing medicine called Marcaine or Bupivacaine. And so I tell my patients, if you walk out a changed woman or man and your back pain is significantly better, it means that we've numbed up the not only the correct joint, but the correct anatomy. We've also proven that it's not from the disc or from the sac sacroiliac joint or from a pinched nerve from spinal stenosis. Those aren't the issues. We now have, with a high degree of confidence, a belief that the pain is coming from the arthritic facet joint. That's just the test. The treatment then, the next step in treatment becomes something called a facet joint nerve ablation. But I'll tell you a little secret. Some people get meaningful, long-standing relief from the facet joint nerve block. Why? Because most practitioners, um, I certainly do, generally include a little bit of anti-inflammatory steroid. So we put that also right next to the arthritic joint. If it is a mild problem, and mild is depending on the degree of the uh, pathologic change as opposed to your, your symptoms, but if we can reduce the inflammation enough just from the nearby uh, steroid, sometimes that's enough to not only diminish the pain temporarily, but also long-term. How long-term? It can be months, it can be years. I've had plenty of patients who get years long relief. It's not the majority by any stretch, but it's a significant, maybe 10, maybe even 20% um, uh, of folks get at least months of relief from the facet joint nerve block. But the, the, here's the take home. What really matters is not the days of, of relief thereafter. It is the actual a day of the procedure, how much re relief you get during that day and how much, not the duration, but how much relief. Is it 20%? Not a big uh, uh, incentive to proceed on. Proving, let's say it's a low relief, it's probably something else. It's a disc, it's spinal stenosis. But if you leave with a dramatic improvement, 80, 90, 100% relief, then we know the facet joint is the arthritic or is the source of pain. And likely, if we treat it, you can get better. So how do we treat it long-term? Okay, so now you're walking out pain-free. You've had the facet joint nerve block. Moments have passed. You're feeling much better. You now know with a high degree of confidence that the pain's coming from the joint. It's not gonna last. That's the bad news. For about 10, 20% of patients, they're gonna get great relief, but what about those 80% of patients who are gonna get great relief right away, but it won't last? Many more options exist. The next thing we're gonna do is not a facet joint nerve ablation, the treatment, but if you have insurance, and most of you do, and especially Medicare, they're going to ask us to deny treatment or any visits for two weeks. The rationale behind this, has no bearing, there is no rationale. It's financial, that's just the long and short of it. They simply want to delay the care and save money, sad to say. So two weeks pass, you had great relief, it was temporary, you're back to pain with walking, you come in, we assess you. You tell us the story that you could have told us on day one, but you've had to wait two weeks, nevertheless. Now we have to actually do it again. Rather frustrating, you might say. I can understand. Our hands are tied as physicians. This is not the best course of treatment for you, but it is what your insurance pays for. And so this incredibly cheap block 
would be paid for by your insurance if you follow the rules, if we follow the rules, which are wait two weeks, come back, see us, have our discussion, tell us if you got relief. And if you did, if you got dramatic relief, you are a candidate for a second block. You come in, you do it again, exact same procedure. If you get relief a second time, this is kind of like looking in um, twice for something and proving it to yourself uh, that it's there. But if you get relief the second time, we do know that the chance of relief with the ablation actually goes up by about 10, 15%, but then you become a candidate. So two blocks, both giving temporary, but several hours of relief after the block, now you're a candidate for the ablation. What is an ablation? Sounds scary. Um, we do this in other parts of the body, of course. It is a controlled thermal destruction. <laughs> Very controlled, I might add. Very small. It is thermal. We use heat, 80 degrees, not barbecue temperature, but enough that the little nerves that we're going after will unwind. The proteins will denature and the nerve will essentially fall apart. Enough so that it no longer feels the pain in the joint. Just think it's a block, just like the marking, just like the lidocaine, that lasts months to years. That's how it works. So what's that like? Sounds painful. Well, for some, it's a little more painful, but for some, it's just a little more painful. For the gross majority, it's no different than the facet joint nerve block. Why? Because we're using a needle just like we used during the block, which was minimally painful anyway. So I don't sedate people for this. I think it's actually dangerous to sedate people for uh, these types of procedures. I think it reduces the, uh, the feedback from the patient in terms of their ability to tell you if you're in the wrong spot. Uh, and this, quite honestly, the, pa the pain should be quite tolerable. Uh, how, how, how much is that? Well, no more than getting a tooth numbed up, for example. That's, I think there are more nerves going to your teeth than ever go to facet joints. So the tooth numbing up, at least that I've had, is uh, it's fairly significant. So what is the ablation? You come in on the day, you're probably nervous because you don't know what's gonna happen. You lie down on the table, we get you ready and get your back prepped, et cetera. It's just like the block. Put in the little needles. This type of needle is called a radio frequency or rhizotomy needle. It's a little larger, not much, but it's a specialized needle in that the tip of the needle is unshielded. And it's the last centimeter or half centimeter. It depends if we're doing it at your neck or in your low back and it gets hot. How hot? 80 degrees. We hold it at 80 degrees next to the nerve for 90 seconds, and then you're done. We numb up the nerve before we do it, so you really don't feel much. We do a few tests to make sure we're not in the wrong spot, so to speak, not next to any other nerves. And so we're asking, uh, making sure it doesn't say go down your arm or your legs as we're doing the test. But if that's the case, we proceed on and we do the ablation, and then we take the nerve, uh, the needle out. It's quick, it's easy, it takes about maybe 20 minutes um, or less in skilled hands. Uh, we generally do it on one side and then have you come back for the other side. The tissue trauma is a little bit more, so you need to have some recovery plans. You uh, take some Tylenol or uh, Advil, it's easily tolerated if you do those things. And then you heal up, but you heal up without the function of the facet joint nerve. We don't kill the nerve. We just trim the last little fingertips of that nerve right as they sprout and attach to the joint. Sadly, the nerve that we didn't kill will grow back in time. How long? Well, the average is about 400 days, plus or minus six months on average. That's first standard deviation fits within that. Some people get five years relief. They're the gross mi minority. Some people get six months or less, also a minority. Can we do it again? We can. It depends on your payer and on your insurance, but some people, some, uh, some payers require another block. Some actually like Medicare within the certain time frame, you just go on and do the ablation again. You don't have to go through the headache of reproving that, it get, that your, your pain is from the facet joint. So you just simply just come in and have it done again, just like having a, it's actually probably easier than having a cavity filled. Okay. Some of you out there watching this have already had facet joint nerve blocks, have already had ablations, and you may be on the end of the continuum. There's really a bifurcation of patients. It's what we call bimodal distribution. Some get better and are getting better and better in the longer lasting ablations over time. First one was six months, next one was a year, next one was two years. That's one camp of folks. And sadly, there's another camp of folks who are, it's getting less. Why? Well. 
the nerve is growing back, it's finding a different route maybe. And just like I told you, in the majority of people, it sits right here in this little spot. That's where that little line is. Sometimes it grows back in a different spot, a little higher on the wing, a little out on the transverse process, but it's not where we normally go and it evades detection and destruction in that way. So there, these folks, you guys, may be a little more complicated. How do we treat you? Well, we can try and hunt it down, going a little lateral, going a little more medial and find it. The other way we can do things is we can do an endoscopic rhizotomy. So in this way, we do the exact same thing with the ablation, but instead of ablating the nerve using a thin little skinny needle, what we actually do is make a little incision about a pencil size where you're now in the OR, you're now asleep, and we use an endoscope. So now we're doing surgery to a tiny little incision, just like laparoscopic uh, or arthroscopic surgery. We pass the little scope down to where the nerve is normally, and then with our scope, we hunt around and we find it. And then we resect the nerve. We actually cut it out and take out the nerve and then close you back up. This doesn't last months to years. This lasts many years, on average around two to five years, better. But again, not forever in most folks. Now, some people do get better and stay better. And I've been asked why. And my suspicion is, is that in the pathway to, to this, of this journey, we're simply denervating the joint. We're not changing the joint. We're not replacing the joint. We're not putting lubrication in the joint. We're simply stopping you hearing the squeak of the rusty joint. The joint continues to work in most people until it doesn't. And when it doesn't is when it fuses on its own. No big surgery required. It just simply knits together, just like two bones have been fractured, the arthrodial surface is worn away, and now it's just raw bone versus raw bone. And at a certain point, the body just knits that together. We see it all the time on CT scans and MRIs where the joint is now fused. And I think the whole point of the block and ablation is to keep you comfortable while this process occurs over time. Now, a lot of people also say, you know, you've numbed up the joint. What if I really hurt myself? I can't tell if I'm hurting myself. We've had perspective data. We started doing this really in the late 60s, early 70s. So we've been doing it a long time. And let me tell you at the beginning, it was a, a dastardly, uh, somewhat bloody affair. It wasn't needles, it was big nails called a ray nail. We'd pound this thing in into the joint and then wrap a copper wire and cook it. It was brutal, so it's a lot easier. But we are simply turning off the squeak from the joint. The joint works fine, it continues to work. Honestly, if we could do this for hips and knees, because the joint works, the knees bend, the hip moves, it just hurts. So in essence, a hip replacement and knee replacement is a pain management procedure. And if we could do it just as well in the hips and knees, we'd probably put those uh, joint replacement surgeons out of business. Or until it became so painful and the blocks didn't work of the knee or the hip and you'd have to go have your joint replaced. But this is extraordinarily safer, extraordinarily easier, extraordinarily less time consuming than the competitive option, which is what? How did we treat this prior to facet joint nerve ablations? The answer, we fused people. We fused their spine together with a big open dissection down to the posterior lateral portion of the spine, exposing the joints. And I've done this, still do it sometimes. I still fuse facet joints, but we stabilize the entire segment it's a brutal, bloody, long surgery requiring hospitalization and a long-term uh, re recovery and rehab process. So let's say you're one of those folks, you've had the blocks, you've had the ablations, you had the relief, it's no longer lasting, you maybe even had the endoscopic rhizotomy. What is the next step? How else do we treat these things? Well, first and foremost, we wanna make, if you're not getting relief with these, we have to check and make sure there's not another primary etiology that's cooked up, such as, degenerative disc disease that's made itself known, or say spinal stenosis or herniated disc, pressing a nerve. We have to rule those things out by doing the facet joint nerve blocks and the exam, the extension. And if we've done that, we still maintain that it's really hypermobility. We can see on the CT and on the MRI that there's a severely degraded, degraded segment, the joint has fluid in it or is severely worn out. 
What do we do then? And the answer is fusion. But luckily, things have gotten way, way better in terms of the ability to do that percutaneously without a hospital stay, et cetera. I'm gonna show you exactly what I mean. It's this, you can't see it. There you go. That little dot right there in the facet joint is actually a titanium screw. We implant it in the same incision size as I talked about with the endoscopic rhizotomy, no bigger. We simply put a little needle down, we put it into the joint under fluoro, under x-ray. Uh, you could be awake for this, I generally put people to sleep, but you could. And then we put a tiny little drill into the joint, just like you were having some dental work. And then we place this little stabilizing device called an ion facet screw. What does that do? It stabilizes the joint and there's no more motion, not only at the joint, it actually works on the disc too. It stabilizes the entire segment. As you know, loss of mobility is both good and bad, but if the rest of your animal is suffering, your body, you're not able to walk or do, then we know that this is well worth it. There's an interesting study looking at um, uh, joint replacement, hips and knees. And the study doesn't look at the pain from the hips and knees, it actually looks at the rate of heart attack and stroke, cardiovascular disease as it persists. And we know, looking at uh, population-based data, that people that have joint replacement actually live longer and die at a lower rate. But we didn't really know why. And the truth is, it is their heart is healthier. Why? Because they can do. They can walk, they can exercise, they can participate in the activities of daily living. And even though you're not getting on a spinning bike or going and running two or three miles, you're still getting cardiovascular benefit from walking around the grocery store. It's massive. And if you're not, like my poor old mother who's now confined to bed, she, her rate of degradation of the rest of her entire body is accelerated because of her inability to walk. So that's facet joints in a nutshell. I'm sure you're gonna have questions. I'm sure you're gonna have uh, thoughts and comments. Please leave them. I will actually answer them in the comment section below. I'm happy to do that. The point of this video is to educate you so that you become a, an educated consumer of medicine. It works best, democracy works best, medicine works best when you know what the options are and what you're getting. And so that's the whole point of these videos. The better I can do that, the better patient I make you, the better your outcomes will be, the happier you will be, the better the world will be. So thanks for watching. It's been a pleasure. Um, William Porter McRoberts, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Thanks so much. Anodyne Research is my channel, by the way. All right, so here's the exercise. It's super easy. It's easier than brushing your teeth. You don't need a brush. You don't even need teeth. So I'm gonna lie down on my belly. Here's the idea. Those lumbar extension muscles, the back straps, they lie on either side of the spine. If I'm at rest, no activation. As soon as I start to go into extension, I have to activate these muscles. The more I go, more activation. So I'd say stage one is simply doing this. Lifting up, holding your back up, holding your chest off of the bed or the floor. Stage two, lifting and doing both thighs and back at the same time. Stage three, Superman. Pull it out here. Now you're flying through the air. The idea is more leverage. The more you stay like this, the better. How long? What's the right amount of time? Two minutes. That's it. If you can stay up here for two minutes, once a day, that's great. Twice a day, A+. plus. If you do this over time, it'll actually make it hurt worse at first. You'll have more low back pain because now you're activating these muscles that haven't been activated in a long time, like going to the gym. You're going to hurt when you're not doing it. But once you get over that hump, it's going to be better. Hopefully enough that you don't need anything at all. But nevertheless, that's what you do. Lumbar extension, extension um, program. Two minutes, twice a day.